Good evening. Good to be with you this evening and delighted that there are those who are joining us online. We appreciate that so much. You know, in the book of 1 Corinthians, in the 15th chapter, the Apostle Paul has spent, well, it's the longest chapter in the book, a considerable amount of time talking about a central, very, very significant subject to the Christian, and that's the subject of the resurrection. I mean, that's sort of the subject, when you think about it, that puts all of the rest of it into perspective. It's fitting then, perhaps, that this is like the crescendo, the uh, climax to the whole book, especially here at the end of chapter 15, when he's been talking about subjects that are really relevant for you and me today. We have seen in this chapter, in the first 11 verses, that Christ was raised from the dead, a very, very significant fact. And he shows us in the next several verses, up through verse 19, some of the dreadful consequences that would follow if there were no resurrection of the dead, as apparently some were claiming there, even in Corinth. He also shows us that Christ was the first fruits, the, the first fruits of the, those who would be raised from the dead meaning, of course, that there would be more to follow. And then in verses 29 through 34, he gave us some supplemental arguments that are really good to know. And he talked about uh, baptism for the dead, things of that nature. And then beginning at verse 35, this uh, section concerning the resurrection body. What kind of body are we going to have uh, at the time of the resurrection? At the very end, these last few verses in the chapter is the mystery revealed. So open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll look there at beginning at verse 35, but we've already studied some of the verses, so we'll read through those quickly to get our bearings and then move forward. We want to let these verses guide our lives this week. You may have heard about the scoutmaster who was sort of uh, rebuking one of the scouts who had gotten lost. He said, well, how in the world could you get lost? Didn't you have your compass with you? And he said, yes, sir, I did, but uh, it kept pointing to north, and I wanted to go south. Well, you see, if we don't follow what the Bible teaches, if we don't follow the compass of God's word, it really doesn't do us a lot of good, does it? So when it comes to the resurrection, that's, that's the idea. We want to study it, but we don't want to just study it. We want to follow what direction this is going to lead us in our life. Verse 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what manner of body do they come? Thou foolish one, that which thou sowest thyself is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, a bare grain, but a bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other kind, but God giveth it a body even as it pleased him. And to each a seed, and to each seed a body of its own. Verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another of fishes. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Now we studied these verses last week and we saw that what Paul is doing is explaining how God can comprehend and create a resurrection body. Occasionally we'll have, you know, some, somebody will say, well, Bob, how could there be a resurrection of the body? I mean, I've known of people who were lost at sea, for example, and their body was lost into the sea, and it was eaten by the fish of the sea. And then those fish were eaten by people. And how in the world can you of that body? Well, I always answer that by saying the same God who could create from nothing this world, this universe, and everything that's in it, don't you think he can handle that? I mean, can't he figure that out? That's what Paul is saying here. God understands the nature of the resurrection body. He's the one that created all these things. He created 
the heavenly or celestial bodies, the terrestrial, uh, beasts of uh, flesh of beasts, bodies of birds and fish, and so on. Verse 41, he says, There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Okay, so you can look into the heavens and see, even in the, in the night sky, that God is preaching a sermon. And he's showing, I, look, I understand all the different uh, variations that there are. I'm the one who made these. Verse 39, or rather verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Okay, here he ap applies it. It is sown in corruption. And I want you to notice the word it there is referring to something definite. This isn't just a generic principle. What is it that is sown or planted or, or buried? It's the physical body. Now it may be in a traditional tomb. It may be in the ocean. It may be in, in any number of ways, but the body, the physical body, gets sown, if you will. That's the illustration. Follow that through now, what, what Paul is using. It is sown in corruption. Now watch it. It is raised in incorruption. So what is raised in incorruption? The same thing that is sown in corruption. It's going to be changed. It's no longer going to be corruptible, but it's the same thing. It's the body. Somebody says, are you saying we're going to have our physical body when we're, raised, when we're raised from that? I didn't say physical body, but we're going to have our body. It's going to be changed. That's what Paul is saying here. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. You see the change? It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body, Paul says. So the resurrection is going to represent a change. And then he re refers us to Adam. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Well, who is that last man, Adam? It's the same person that he has been likening to Adam all along, it's Jesus Christ. Jesus, just as Adam had breathed into his body a, the life from God and he became a living soul, in the same way, this second Adam, if you will, Jesus Christ, is going to become a life-giving spirit. Adam received life from God. Christ gives life as God. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. There'll be no more Adams, by the way. This is it. This is the conclusion and the climax of the plan of God. Verse 46, how be it? That is not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, then that which is spiritual. You see the natural order here. He had just told them that it's important that all things be done decently and in order. And he's showing them that God follows his own rules. The first man is of the earth, earthy. And the second man is of heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. You see, we are currently living in that earthy body. But we have stamped upon us, as it were, the very uh, image of God. And so he says in verse 49, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So that should tell us begin to get a, a better idea about where our priorities should be, where our focus should be in this life. Try to see the things that are spiritual. Try to focus not on flesh and blood, not on corruption, but on the kingdom of God and upon incorruption, 
Now, finally here, he tells us the mystery. Look at beginning at verse 51. Behold, he says. In other words, look at this. Look at here. Behold, he says, I tell you a mystery. We all shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, folks, I don't know when Christ is coming again. You don't know it either. I'm certain of that because Jesus said, No man, that day and hour knoweth no man, Matthew chapter 24, referring there to the end of the world after discussing the end of Jerusalem and giving specific signs regarding that. He now turns to the end of the world and he says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Even he himself, he said, did not know, not, neither the Son, but the Father only. I don't know when Jesus is coming again, but I know this. When he comes again, those Christians who are still here, who are living at that time, shall not sleep. That is, they shall not de die. This is a euphemism for death. Death is often pictured in the Bible as a type of sleep, and it is put for death. This word, he says, we all shall not die or not sleep. But we shall all be changed. So even those who are alive when Christ comes again are going to be changed at that moment, at that time. He says it will happen in a moment, verse 52. A moment, that is in, in an instant. In the twinkling of an eye. How long does it take you to blink your eye or to notice the twinkle in somebody's eye? The twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Notice there, singular. The Bible doesn't say trumpets will sound. It says the last trump. Singular, as if a clarion call to action. An announcement. Like a, a king entering the room. And the trumpet calls all to attention. And he says the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised, how? Incorruptible. The word incorruptible means no longer subject to decay. No longer subject to decay. Even the things of finest preservation on this earth are subject to decay. But the human body, when changed by God, will no longer be subject to decay. You know, you can go into uh, the museums of uh, Jerusalem and see ancient manuscripts that, were, uh, that date back hundreds, yea, over a thousand years in age, manuscripts of the Bible, some of them dating back long before that, even before Jesus Christ. The uh, so-called Dead Sea Scrolls, and the writing, for example, the book of Isaiah, some 700 years before Christ, that was discovered just a few generations ago. It was discovered in the 1940s. And it was beautifully preserved in a clay jar there in the, on the banks of the Dead Sea, in the caves there in the Qumran communities. But as, much, as marvelous as that is, if you, if you look carefully, you'll see signs of aging. And even that, as ancient as it is, is beginning to decay. That's why it is so carefully preserved. It's so valuable. The United States Constitution, the document and the paper on which it was written, greatly preserved. Some people spend a lifetime preserving antiques and homes and houses. Well, all of that's wonderful. But the preservation of the body by God will surpass all of that. It's like nothing that the world can know because it's going to be incorruptible. It cannot corrupt anymore. And he says, we shall be changed. For this corruptible, verse 53, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, notice it's like 
putting on a garment. He's describing it in, in terms of clothing, if you will. When this corruptible will have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What a climactic and beautiful pronouncement to end this discussion with concerning the resurrection. Death is swallowed up in victory. You see, when Christ rose, was raised from the dead, he made this victory possible. We can be victors with Christ. He's the one that makes this victory possible, makes it ours. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then he asks this pointed question, Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Kind of puts things in a, a different perspective, doesn't it? See, death is not uh, enjoyable. It's not something pleasant right now in this earthly existence. It's, not, it's something that we, we, we hate it. We hate death. But when you really look at it in the perspective of what Paul is revealing here in the revelation of this great mystery, he's, he's taking the sting out of it. Sometimes I will get a little splinter or something or a sting in my finger and I'll take a little bit of that uh, ointment. What do they call it? Uh, you know what it is. Comes in a little tube and put it on there. Neosporin. And it all, oh, it, it just feels better almost instantaneously. It takes the sting out. When Christians understand the mystery that's being revealed right here in these verses, it takes the sting out of death like a balm of what? Gilead. Christ for his people, Christians. The sting of death, he says, is sin. You see, if we die still in our sins, then, then there's a sting involved with death. Nobody should die still in their sins. Are you still in your sins? I wouldn't want to leave this assembly, this building tonight of travel, and especially Interstate 81, still in my sins. If you're in your sins this evening, you need to respond in obedience to the Lord's invitation and let, let him take the sting out of death. And the power of sin, he says, is the law. To stand before God as a lawbreaker, as a sinner, would be a horrible thought. But thanks be to God, verse 57, thanks be to God who giveth us the what? The victory. Faith in Jesus Christ is the victory that overcomes the world as Christ. And then, wherefore, in view of all of this, look at the summit of his argument. He says, brethren, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Not some of the time, not fits and starts, but consistently always abounding without ceasing. In the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not vain or useless in the Lord. What an amazing discussion and explanation of the resurrection by the Apostle Paul. I want to move now to some points to ponder as we close our thoughts for this evening. And I'm finishing just a little early because I have a special announcement at the end that I want to share with you. And don't worry, I'll still get you out in time to see Colombo, Ernie. Uh, points to ponder. Number one, the resurrection of Christ is central to the gospel. It is absolutely 
center stage. Look at verse 4 in this chapter. He says, and that he was buried and that he hath been raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That was predicted, it was prophesied, and it happened. And that is a central part of the gospel. That's, that's not one of those in, uh, dispensable sideline points. Secondly, Christ's resurrection is a well-documented historical fact. Verses 5 through 8 lay out the list of witnesses that would rival any list of witnesses in a criminal prosecution today of typical nature, probably more evidence for this than any of those cases involved involving our jurisprudence today. You can be certain of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not, not by a preponderance of the evidence, not by clear and convincing evidence, not even beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond all doubt. You can be sure of that historical fact. Number three, Christ's resurrection is proof, watch it now, proof of our resurrection, you see? It's not just that there was an historical man by the name of Jesus Christ raised from the dead. It's what that points to that is so significant for you and me. My faith is in Jesus Christ because of what it does for me and for those that I love and how it affects life today, 1 Corinthians today. And then consider what Christ sacrificed to die for you and me. I was talking with an atheist one time who basically was mocking the idea of Christ's death and burial. And he said, well, you know, if, I, if that were true, if I were in that position, I knew that I was going to be raised from the dead. I could stand to put up with a lot of suffering. Missed the point entirely. I'm not sure that I could have explained it to him had I had days to do so. Listen to verse 28. And when all things have been subjected unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subjected to him that did subject all things unto him, that God may be all in all. Do you realize that Jesus Christ gave up a position of eternal equality with God. That's what that verse is saying. And he did it out of love for you and for me. Very, very significant. Next, we will have new bodies. Don't doubt, don't ever doubt about that. And if you're ever getting to kind of feel discouraged about your body, as you begin to see the ravages of time and the the natural effects of aging, which is as God intended it. Just remember, there's a new one coming. We will have that new body. And be careful, therefore, with too much emphasis upon your existing body. Now, you girls especially, be careful with that emphasis upon your beautiful body. Don't misunderstand me. I, I, I've, you know, we raised a, a Young lady, beautiful girl. I understand what it's like when she's before the mirror primping and getting ready to go to services or whatever it may be. And, and I, I love you women for that. that you, you, don't, you don't need to stop putting on the makeup for me. But you just remember. The emphasis needs to remain primarily on where we're going, not where we are. And you men can be guilty of this, too. I've known of some young men that have, have been so infatuated with their body, you'd think that reading their Facebook page was an was a art gallery about the wondrous works of their own body. Listen, God understands all of that. He's the one that created your body. Just keep the perspective where it belongs. Be careful about overemphasizing that which is only temporary, verse 50. And then, to the Christian, there are far worse things than death. I guess if I could say anything by way of encouragement to those who look around and they see death around them in our families, and if I might be reminded of this important fact myself, that, 
that death to the Christian is not really bad news. The Apostle Paul, it has been said, had sort of a death wish himself because he said, for me to die and be with Christ is, is very much, what, better. But he said, I know it's more needful for you that I remain here. I've got work to do here. I understand that. But you know what? It's really better for me, he said, to go ahead and die and be with Christ. To the Christian, there are some far worse things than death. The people of the world, they don't, they don't understand that because all they can see is the temporal, the here and the now. This chapter gives us an insight into beyond the here and the now. And then finally, your spiritual efforts, friends, are not in vain. Your work, your labor, your dedicated, unceasing service Jesus Christ is being noticed. It's being noticed by God. You may think nobody else cares. Nobody's noticing what I'm trying to do. Well, a lot of people may really not be noticing. I'll just be honest with you, but I'll tell you someone who is. And that's really all that matters, isn't it? That's God. Your labor, Paul says, is not in vain in the Lord. Before extending the invitation, let's look forward to Sunday evenings next year for a moment. This year, we have worked our way through the book of 1 Corinthians, the text of the study. We have chapter 16 yet to go, which is, other than a discussion of the contribution, is largely some personal remarks there at the end. We will move through that in a sort of a summary fashion. Lord willing, in two more sermons, and we will conclude that study of 1 Corinthians. Sunday nights is a special time for me. It is for the church here at Central. It's a time where brethren gather who are perhaps more interested in even a little deeper study than what is sometimes possible on a Sunday morning. The, the atmosphere is maybe a little more informal, the subjects are deeper into God's word sometimes. Sometimes the numbers are a little smaller and more intimate and, and more uh, closely connected one with another. It's just a special time. Uh, sometimes it is the cream of the crop in terms of the faithful Christians of the congregation because if you see the importance of being here on Sunday night, you have grasped something that some members have a hard time ever getting. You see the importance of worshiping God together with his people. And I've always tried to remember that and to offer things on Sunday nights that are especially valuable. Last year, we looked at a study of the book of James, working through the text of that marvelous epistle. Before that, 1 John. And the year before that, 1 Peter. And the year before that, the Kings and Chronicles, and the year before that, the book of Luke. Remember, lead me gently home. For six years on Sunday nights, we've been looking at textual studies and marching through some particular book or books of the Bible. Starting after the first of the year, we're going to take a topical approach for a while, take a little break from the straight textual study and look at Bible topics. And we're going to do it in the format of questions and answers, Bible questions and answers. That's why in the bulletin extra today, there was that explanation about what to expect on Sunday nights. I want to encourage you that if you have a Bible question that's been bothering you or something you've been wondering about, and particularly if you think that it would be helpful to others, you see, Please submit that to me between now and then. Uh, don't submit it to me orally, but submit it to me in writing. Give it to me in a written note. You can mail it or hand it to me or email it or text it, but give it to me in writing because I'm not like Jonathan. I won't remember it if you just tell me orally. I will forget it. Uh, 
I received one the other day just to give you an, an example. This is, this is a letter that came, uh, well, it's postmarked 26 October 2020. And I get these from time to time because we publish Bible questions and answers in a newspaper of about 3,000 circulation up in Huntington County, Pennsylvania. And it says, uh, it says Reverend Vale, Jr. Now you can disregard that first word. This is a person who just doesn't understand that only God is reverend in the Bible. Did you know that? Only God is referred to as reverend in the Bible. So we, that, we don't use that title, but I, I appreciate what they're trying to say. It says, I enjoy reading your article in the Broad Talk Bulletin. Would you please write about the Antichrist? Folks, there are a lot of our denominational friends who are interested in the Antichrist. For some reason, they're really interested in it, and it's probably because they've heard so much about the Antichrist on radio and TV. So what, what we will do, Lord willing, we'll look at what the Bible says about the Antichrist. The Bible does have something to say about that. And it says, I look forward to your reply. Well, I look forward to being able to reply to that, hopefully. And other questions from the Bible that you may have, if you would submit those, we'll try to get to them in order of general interest. And I hope that'll be helpful to us on Sunday nights next year. If you're subject to our Lord's invitation this evening, Please don't delay. Make your desires known by stepping out. If you're here in person, come forward. Let us assist you if we may. Or if you are online watching and listening, uh, reach out to us at the numbers provided. We'll be happy to assist if we possibly can. If you're subject to his invitation this evening, come. Why not now? While together we stand and sing.